Hello, my name is Glenn Cogburn. I'm minister for the Church of Christ here in Bullard, Texas. As you can see, the pews behind me are still empty, just like last week. Things are still changing drastically. We watch the news daily and we're looking for clues, answers, hope. We're looking for some type of solution, maybe even a complete turnaround for some type of normalcy to come back in our lives. Last week we asked the question, where did the norm go? Norm's pretty hard to find in our own day and time, much more than we would like to admit. But it seems that when we get back to the news, nothing is changing but the statistics. Numbers that were changing by the week are now changing by the day, sometimes even by the hour. The rise in the body count, to put it crudely, looks like a New York Stock Exchange on an upward trend. One moment you look at 12,000, the next moment you see there's 16,000 that have passed away. Then you start looking at others and, and the number of cases that rise, it can peak as many as 60,000 in a 24-hour period for those who have been tested and who have been identified as COVID. 19 victims. What are the deficiencies? Well, the need for more testing and ventilators according to professionals. They even need more hospital beds, medical staff to go along with it. What's the collateral damage? Well, it's not just family members anymore, but it's a host of others that are caught up in this deadly scenario like our first responders. Those brave doctor and nurses that are there, well, in the trenches, on the front lines. Many of them are succumbing to this virus, even though they're dedicated and their service is so sacrificial. My heart continues to break when I think of this unseen enemy. I think back in the days of my own education, I recall a pioneer virologist by the name of Jonas Salk. I remember him referring to some of these tiny little creatures as little assassins. They may, they're made up of uh, genetic material whose only purpose is very pure purpose, and that is to replicate themselves at the expense and the destruction of healthy cells and organisms. What these tiny assassins do, they set dormant and they wait on a host to pass by and whenever they come in contact with one they literally enter our body hijack ourselves disrupt our lives and the only thing that is certain whenever you find a virus especially one of this caliber is that the only thing that's going to rise is the body count but after it's all said and done i can't help but ask myself this question after I turn the television off and put the cell phones away from all of the news and all of the media that, and all of the apps, I wonder if I or we are really paying attention. I wonder if we're getting the message. Sometimes I wonder if some folks are even listening at all. Are we looking, listening, and learning anything at all? Here's why I ask this question. In the past few weeks, I've tried to really pay attention to public leaders, victims who are caught up in the ground floors of this historical biological scourge that's not yet finished with us. There are some touching pleas and testimonies from individuals who found themselves in the very jaws of this unprecedented situation in our own lifetime. These individuals that I'm referring to are or people that you would ordinarily come upon in a different scenario and think maybe very little about. But I'm talking about leaders such as governors and mayors, victims of this, those that are sick, those who have lost loved ones, and even thankful survivors. I remember New York uh, Governor Cuomo in a plea, in a desperate plea, to his own citizens in that state as he sat down and he asked a very profound and simple question and a very penetrating question that 
we all need to listen to very carefully, especially when it comes to listening to the Word of God. What is it all about? What is it about what I have said, he says, that you do not understand? As he tried to get his point across as to the devastating effect that this has in a lapsedaisical type of attitude that we might have toward helping others. 3,000 miles away is the mayor of L.A., and he's talking to the young people, trying to get them to pay attention to what they're doing. He says, you young people, and I quote, you've played enough. Now it's time to grow up. Quit being selfish. Respect others and stay off the streets. You know, I'm still trying to remember a time in our own history where a public official got up and rebuked America's youth and was still in office the next day. How can you forget the cry of, of a young wife mother whenever she thinks of her husband who has passed away one day before his 55th, 45th uh, birthday but could not attend his bedside during his illness nor his coffin in death I'm also reminded of a lady in Northern Ireland who had an aging mother she puts upon the website this is the saddest of times as a family were devastated and heartbroken. In the middle of the night, she records a message to try to get people's attention. And Brenda Daughtery says this, so this morning, this was in the middle of the night, 3 to 4 a.m. in the morning. She said this morning on the news, you'll hear a fourth person has died in Northern Ireland of COVID-19. She continues to say, I just want to let you know that that poor person was my mom. That we loved and was so very proud to have her as our mom. My mom was not just a statistic. She was a woman who had incredible strength. And she had many challenges in her life. Unfortunately, this is one that she would not overcome said, I want to thank everybody in the prayer system for all that they had done for my mom over the years. They have helped us keep her at home. And for the NHS staff, that would be the Northern Ireland uh, Health System, over the last few weeks for the care that they have given and shown to her is totally unbelievable. I want to thank them for the care and compassion they've given to my mom. And for those of you out there, listen to her warning and her message here. And for those of you out there being so scattered out there and selfish, wise up. How selfish can you be? Trying to get our attention. Now, we're not going to get, she continues, we're not going to get to see mom and that celebration of her life. We're not going to have that opportunity at this moment in time. The day will come when we will celebrate my mother's life. But for now, we cannot be with her when she passed. We'll not see her in her coffin, she says. We'll not get to give her a kiss before she goes. But we did all of that when it was important because we did that when my mother was alive, she says, because we were a family that held together. We kept our mother as safe as we could until we could keep her safe no more. She continues with this exhortation. This is the time that people really need to think about others. I have half a bottle of hand wash left, she says, because the shelves are empty. She says, I'm not going to rattle on about this because this is not what this is about. This is about our mom. But my mom was, would not believe how the people are behaving today. She would have thought better of society. Now for those who are out there who are helping, Brenda continues, the vulnerable and the needy, I want to say thank you. My mom was at home and 
was lucky enough to have us to care for her, but not everybody has that. But my mom, she lived life to the fullest, Brenda says. She still had a lot of hard times in her life, but she valued life. Now, if you value life, you will stay in and do as you have been asked by the authorities. Now, my mom may have been the fourth person in Northern Ireland to pass away from COVID-19. But the sad reality is she probably won't be the last. Go around the coast to another individual who was a minister there in Northern Ireland looking into a camera from the ICU unit in Ulster Hospital. He was fighting for breath even under oxygen. I think as I listened to him that he had already been weaned off the ventilator and was making a comeback. He shares these remarks. He says, hello, my name is Mark. I have the coronavirus and I am 40 years of age. This virus is deadly. It wants to kill you. It wants to take all of your life out of your lungs so that you can't even breathe. He said, now I am grateful I am alive today. I want to thank the ICU staff in Ulster. Night and day, 24 seven, he continues, they have worked to save my life and all the doctors and nurses. I want to thank you. He says, I don't know what else to say except I love you. He said, I'm grateful for the loving support that my wife has given me. She's the best wife in the whole world. He says, I love Claire. And then he goes on to say that whenever he was at his lowest and couldn't even talk, as I was trying to listen carefully, he said, Claire, I just want to thank you so much for helping me with this video. He says, I am a minister in Newton Arts. He says, I don't go to a church. Listen to his message, folks. He's giving us his life and his thankfulness. Not only that he's alive, but he knows what he's a part of. He says, I don't just go to church. He said, I belong to a family. And he said, what I love about this family is they have been praying for me and I know that there are others, he says. You see, he received the messages and he saw them from other individuals in Northern Ireland and around the country. And he said, thank you so much for praying for me. He gave a very strong testimony or witness that came like this. I belong to Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I love Jesus. Now remember, he can hardly raise his head off of a pillow. He's on oxygen. And he says, I give Jesus all of the glory right now. Because the Lord Jesus is not only my personal Savior, but He's my healer and He is real. But then listen to Mark carefully. He issues a warning through the camera lens to everyone else that is there in His own congregation. He says, lastly, He says, don't think this won't touch you. The coronavirus, He says, don't think for a moment that this is just a wee cold or cough that you get. He says, please look at me and listen. If you get the coronavirus, Mark says, he says, and you end up in the ICU, that means you're going to struggle for every breath and you'll go on a ventilator. So please, he says, please listen to all the advice that comes from the government. Keep a social distance because Northern Ireland we will get through this. But what we have to do at this moment is to protect the Northern Health System, which is the heart and soul of Northern Ireland right now. They need us. He said, I've seen their faces. I've spoken with them. He said, you can tell some have come to the terms with it that they are going to get the coronavirus. He said, let that sink in. Can you imagine staring at someone who is so committed to you and your welfare that they know that they will get the disease you have 
and will most likely succumb to it. That's why Mark would exhort us and give us some very simple application like this. Do your part, stay at home, and just because we're social distancing, he says, that doesn't mean you can't pick the phone up. Please call your loved ones, your friends, and your neighbors. Be wise, be kind, love, and protect the NHS and others. Love to you all. Thank you so much. Mark concludes. What we're experiencing today is unprecedented. Matter of fact, you have to look back historically to find anything at all of this magnitude. These are the times that drives not only politicians, but historians, journalists, the World Health Organization, the CDC, and even our own medical system to look back into history, to look for statistics, behaviors, exponential possibilities, biological connections, just to see what the possibilities are. All the while, they're asking themselves questions like, what is the real potential of this deadly, unseen enemy we're dealing with? How do we keep it from spreading? What brought it our way? How is it transmitted? Can someone tell us about it? Are there eyewitnesses that survive that can give us the details of what they experienced? You see, we're always looking for credibility in the account as we are desperately searching for clues, answers, and hope to solve this worldwide problem. Let me share a few historical notes with you. I notice that they continually mention the influenza pandemic of 1918. Let me put it in a summary form best I can. I recall my days whenever I was studying along these lines and someone often referred to it as the Spanish flu. This was one of the worst natural disasters that the world had ever known on a global scale. There were more people that were killed from this pandemic of 1918 than were killed in the entire First World War. You see, the war itself was the problem. If there had been no World War I, scientists believed that the year's strain of flu influenza that was coming out would not have been spread and would have not had near the toll. But instead, when Allied troops met in northern France, they were ready to exchange fire with the enemy. They not only exchanged well, fire, but they also exchanged something else, and that was this unseen enemy of their day. And the pandemic began. When World War I had ended, infantry came home, but little did they know that they were carrying the scourge of the century back with them. It went from northern France to the United States. It was disseminated in Boston. Our military went home from there. The virus struck every major city in the United States, dropping many people where they stood. In New York and other places, you could see signs that were posted and it read like this, along with other comments, go home, go to bed until you are well. The influenza pandemic of 1918 killed at least 20 million, 20 million people worldwide. I've seen newer figures since that time where other scientists and historians evidently give a more, well, a larger estimate than that. They believe it may have killed as many as 50 million people. At Fort Devens, Massachusetts, after disembarking from the ships from September the 1st all the way to September the 18th, one case turned into 6,000 and it took only 17 days to do so. Reports tell us that India lost 4% of its population in that day and time. Alaska lost 8% of its population. And the South Seas lost 20% of its population. People were absolutely panic-stricken, so the accounts go. You could be playing cards one night with some friends or dominoes only to hear the next day that they were already dead. Are we looking, listening, 
and learning. Sometimes I wonder if what we're going through right now is not just a, another exercise in, well, social futility. And when it's all over and said and done, I wonder if we'll just catch ourselves pulling the head out of the sand, so to speak, and going back to our national pastimes and give no more attention to what has just happened to us. To our congregation that meets in this auditorium on a weekly basis, I want to thank you for your faithfulness. I want to thank you for your faith. I want to thank you for being real. I want to thank you for not hiding from the realities and the problems that exist in your own life. Again, I have no idea where social media will take this little blurb or expert ex, excerpt. So if you're listening and you're not a member of this marvelous congregation that meets here, I know you might be asking along with my own folks here that that meet from week to week, are there any spiritual takeaways? Are there any lessons that we can learn? And the answer is yes, there is. It's a marvelous thing to be able to witness people's lives and to see their faith, their dedication. The quality of life that they live, there are people that come here every week that I'm proud to know. Matter of fact, I'm just thankful that their dedicated and loving and caring lives have just passed in front of me to give me an opportunity to look at those examples and be a better person. We have great leadership here. The elders in this congregation are individuals who, well, they're not really arrogant. They're loving, they're caring, they're concerned about the spiritual family here and its welfare. So to our own members and our own congregation, let me remind you that if you are suffering in any way or you're hurting in any way at this point in our struggle against this COVID pandemic, be sure and let me, let the elders here, the deacons, other members of this church family, let us know. Don't go through it alone. Our elders here are always concerned that we pay attention to people. We pay attention to what's going on around us. They want us to be as current as possible. They want us to know what's happening in the lives of individuals, not because we're nosy people, because we're not, but because we love people. We're supposed to be like Jesus Christ, our Lord, as the individual in Northern Ireland indicated I want you to know that it even makes me re-examine my own selves I know that the people here they're no stranger to hard work they're no stranger to the loss of lives and the loss of loved ones from all ages I know that they care deeply about one another because I see it in the the cards that they send us to encourage us in the phone calls we get in the text messages we receive. I see them weekly come in this building knowing that I'm going to get up in a pulpit and persecute them one more time. And I say that with a smile, bless their hearts. But I love them so. I want you to know that this COVID-19, as I watch the news and look at the weekly changes, I see a lot of spiritual takeaways even for my own life. Number one, it reminds me that I cannot be an individual that sits on the sidelines. I have to be a participant. Whether I like it or not, I am. Because there's no going back when COVID-19 gives it a rest and maybe we'll give us a break for a little while. There's no going back. There's been too many people who have been infected with a virus. There have been too many deaths and too many survivors who will, according to scientists and experts, experience a great deal of physical problems from now on, possibly. 
It's right here in our own backyard. Matter of fact, our own county within just a few days went from eight cases to 27. And now the rains are being tightened in around us so that we don't have near as much going out as we used to for our own welfare and protection. I wonder if we're listening and paying attention to our public officials and to the government. You see, we have an obligation to. They don't exist without being put there. And Paul reminded us in the great book of Romans that these people are ordained of God and they are there for our welfare and our benefit. And we need to respect that. I cringe at the thought of, well, having to deal with the consequences of COVID-19 because I was not listening carefully. I wouldn't blatantly go out and hurt somebody on purpose. But when we don't pay attention to our own leaders who tell us to stay at home, be very careful, continue to wash our hands, watch out for our, our hand-to-mouth contact. When we don't listen to these basic things that they are teaching us and telling us to pay attention to, we're in trouble. And not only do we get in trouble, we, well, we inadvertently can affect an entire array of individuals unknowingly. Wouldn't that be a shame? There are a couple of passages I'd like to call your minds to because of all of the questions over the past week, all of the testimonies that I've seen, there are a few common threads that just keep shining through. Number one, they want us to look, even when they're still on hospital beds, at what COVID-19 will do to them. They want us to listen to their testimonies about the disease and how it strips them of a quality of life. And those that die, their families are asking us to pay close attention because they're not able to attend them in their illness nor even in their death. They want us to learn. Over in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 10, there's a very simple little phrase that the Apostle Paul shares with us. He says, try to learn what is pleasing to God. As Christians, isn't that the very least thing that we can do? since we're wanting to go to heaven to be with Him forevermore. Matthew chapter 14, there is a passage of Scripture there that teaches us so many things. There are a lot of spiritual takeaways from this passage when we ask the question, are we really paying attention? We might ought to ask ourselves the question, how vulnerable are we? And then how determined are we to look, listen, learn, and even worship during times like this whenever we're caught up in the squall and the storm that's around us? We're always looking for a historical account with credibility. And here we don't have one. We don't have two eyewitnesses here. We have 12 that remind us of the very thing that happened when Jesus walked the face of the earth. I think you'll recall in Matthew chapter 14, the passage is very vivid. Jesus had just fed 4,000 individuals. He had dismissed the disciples to go in the boat. They were going to cross the sea. Jesus Himself stayed and He was going to dismiss the huge crowd because He knew the tendency of crowds. Sometimes they get caught up, caught up in the fever and the panic of the day and they're ready to well whisk you away and even make you a king one that you were not really appointed to be jesus was not going to be a king here on earth during this day and time he came to seek and save the lost and to give be a, be a ransom for many and a servant to many not to be their king while he walked here but immediately after he had sent the boat that the disciples were into the other side. And after he'd sent the crowds away, he went up to the mountain by himself, the text says, to pray. It was evening. It was already late. He was there alone. The boat had already gone a, a long distance away. 
Jesus saw it and he saw that the boat was going against the wind. Well, I'll tell you, wouldn't you say that's what Society is doing right now with this coronavirus. We're going against the tide. Seems like it's unstoppable. Seems like nothing can keep it at bay, especially when we're not looking and listening to the guidelines. But on the fourth watch of the night, somewhere around 3 a.m. in the morning, approximately the same time that Brenda recorded that about her caring and loving mother and the great loss that she endured. Jesus, he saw people that were in trouble and they were out on the sea. He went down, he walked on the shore, he got on the water and he walked out toward them. And you know, there was something that I missed in this passage of Scripture whenever I was Young, I was still trying to figure out how it was that when Jesus was in the dark and everything was dark during this storm, how it was that the disciples could even see him? And then finally one day at dawn, don't mean that this was a complete storm. The wind was blowing. The waves were coming up and spilling over into the boat. Lightning was intermittent. So when the disciples are in the boat, there's darkness and then there's lightning. Darkness and then there's lightning. And during the light, they could look out and they could see Jesus walking, except they didn't know it was Him. They were in great fear and they cried out. And the only thing that gave them a little bit of hope was Jesus speaking to them and He said, Take courage. It's I. You don't have to be afraid. Peter. Well, old Peter. He gives us something to live by. You know what Peter does? Peter looks and he says, Lord, if it is You, bid me to come to You. New American Standard Version says, Command me to come to You. And you know what Jesus said? He said, Peter, come on. Peter dares to get out of the boat and go toward Jesus under such stormy circumstances. You know, if you want a spiritual takeaway from all that's happening, I'll tell you one of the things we can do is remember that Jesus always calls us to come to Him no matter when it is. doesn't matter if it's a storm of a COVID virus or whether you're out in the middle of the sea and the days are dark and the wind is up and the tide is spilling over and the water is spilling into your boat. It doesn't matter. Jesus says, come to me. I think there's some interesting things that really take place here. Remember we said that it's dark and then there's lightning? Darkness and then light. Peter is focused upon Jesus. He's staying with them. There's darkness and then light. He still sees Him. He's still going toward Him. And then all of a sudden, there must have been darkness. And when there was light, all of a sudden, instead of seeing Jesus, He saw the waves and the winds that were coming upon Him. And you and I know that He took His eye off of Jesus, saw that, and immediately darkness and he began to sink. But Jesus knew and Peter knew the proximity of one another and Jesus, he stays on course and so does Peter. Peter cries out. One simple phrase but heartfelt prayer. Lord, save me. Jesus was so close that he reached and stretched out his hand and he grabbed Peter and pulled him up out of the water. Now you would think that after that, that everything would have been calm, there would have been peace, there would have been no more waves, and the storm would have subsided, but it didn't. 
hand in hand with Peter in the midst of the storm. Where were they going to the boat? Why wasn't the story in the account over? Because the master of the sea is also the captain of the ship. And there were others to be saved. He takes Peter and together they go and they get inside the boat. And once they are inside the boat, there is peace, there is calm. And everybody must have been looking. Everybody must have been listening. And they certainly must have been learning. Because the very next thing that happened was that they all bowed down and they worshiped him saying, you are certainly God's son. We're still in the storm of COVID-19. But I can assure you that Jesus is walking beside us. He doesn't allow us to go through anything that He Himself has not gone through, and nor will He allow us to go through anything that He's not willing us to give the grace to endure. I find it interesting in James chapter 1 that it reminds us that there are two types of tests in this world. There are these ordinary events in life, for lack of a better term, that will overtake us and literally tax our spiritual energies. And then there are those that are sinister in nature and they are, well, they literally want to destroy our spirituality. And if we're not careful, both of them can destroy our souls. They don't have to. If we'll listen, look and learn and worship our Heavenly Father and keep our trust in Jesus Christ. He'll walk with us through the storm. And then one day He'll call us home. And when He does, you and I have the privilege of being with Him. Walking streets that are described as gold, yet transparent and as glass. And whenever you walk streets where gold is as common as asphalt, and Jesus Christ is the tour guide in heaven and He takes you right to the throne of God Himself and introduces you to Him. And God looks from the throne and thinks so much of you because you are with Jesus Christ and loves you so much that He will stoop down from the throne of heaven itself and wipe away all of our tears and sorrows that we've ever known in this lifetime even the horrors of COVID-19. I hope in the coming week that you'll take time to sit down and open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14. Read of the account of Jesus as He walks upon the water going to His disciples that were fearful and so afraid. Why are we afraid? Why do we not pay attention? How vulnerable are we? Do we have to wait for an all-out storm that comes across the waters at us at record speed and takes no prisoners? Do we have to wait for that? To look for Jesus, to listen to Jesus, to learn from Jesus, or to worship Him? That's one thing that I appreciate so much about this congregation that normally comes in and sits in these pews. They're tried. They're tested. They're found true. Because they don't just come here to worship a Heavenly Father in good times. They come whenever the times in their lives are not so good and they've lost loved ones. They come whenever... They feel at their lowest time and period in their own lives, they still come to worship the Heavenly Father, sing praises to Him, and to commemorate the death, burial, and resurrection in the Lord's Supper on a weekly basis. That's why I love these people so very much. Our community is full of them. Isn't that a marvelous thing? 
I hope this week you'll be a seeker and you'll seek Jesus and that you'll find him. But there's no greater place that you can find him than in God's word because after all, it's his word to us with all of his promises and all of the things that pertain to salvation of our souls. I hope you'll tune in next time as we continue to seek and search, look, learn, and listen. From our Heavenly Father, His Holy Word, about our eternal Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you.